Of course, the history of pH does not uh, start with 1967. It goes back a very long way, actually, to the end of the 19th century. But there was nothing much happening. In the 60s, uh, an epidemic of a, an appetite suppressant drugs, drug caused an, uh, caused an epidemic. The first cases were reported in Switzerland, Germany, and Austria. And there were approximately 600 in people in total by 1985. So this really sparked a renewed interest in the condition. And in fact, it led to the first pH symposium being convened in Geneva in Switzerland, which was sponsored by the WHO and focused on primary pulmonary hypertension, as it was called at the time. It's now called idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. And um, this led to the first ever official pH classification. Now, if you can imagine, there were 17 people at the first pH symposium. There were over 2,000 at the last one in Nice, just to give you an idea. So further to the symposium, in 1981, the very first patient registry was set up in the United States by the National Institute for Health, NIH. And there were 187 patients included between 1981 and 1985. Another important milestone, in 1982, Sir John Vane was awarded the Nobel Prize for the discovery of prostacycline. Mm -hmm. In the mid-90s, the first trials started to take place on epiprostanol, which is a prostacycline analog, followed by the first randomized trials. And very important development in the 90s, the World Wide Web goes public. So by the 1990s, what had happened? A lot of things had happened. First of all, there was much more knowledge about pH, which was available from pathology studies, from the NIH registry, and the clinical trials findings. Aflolin was approved, which was the first ever pH drug on the market. There was start of research on new potential treatments. And the first lung transplant program started. Just to give an idea, my own, the surgeon who operated me started his program in the late 80s, 90s, 18, 1989. 90. And the first patient support group was founded in the USA. And I have to say, being having been diagnosed 35 years ago when nothing at all was happening, there were no drugs, no patients, no expert centers, nothing. When the PHA went online and created a message board, that for me became a lifeline. I was very lost and isolated, as I can imagine most patients around those times were. And it, it made a huge difference. In fact, I met my very first patients on the USA on the PHA message board. So I now hand over to Matt, who's gonna be telling us about his, um, the pioneering, the pioneer in uh, the PH association movement, the PHA. Matt. Thank you, Pisana. Yes, thank you. Let me now share my screen as well. And hopefully everyone can see that. Perfect. Great. So Pisana, like Pisana said, and like Bob said, I'm Mike Granado, I'm the President and CEO of PHA. And today I want to talk about the topic of this webinar, which is the, the rise of the PH associations and how we are still today shaping the, the healthcare landscape. So I wanted to start first with um, making you all familiar with PHA's mission and, and vision, because I think it's something we all share across the world. Our vision is really to um, affect a world without pH. And we talk about hope because that's what drives us. And our mission is to extend and improve the lives of those affected by pH. So I wanna start with a little bit of uh, a history lesson about PHA. We recently celebrated our 30th anniversary, but things got started way before that. And some of that is what Pisana just talked about. It, in 1978, uh, Dorothy Olson was one of our first patients, and she faced a medical mystery that led her to spend five weeks in the hospital. And it took a medical resident um, the ability to diagnose her with this rare uh, disease that was pulmonary hypertension, and that shed light on her condition. So for nine years, Dorothy tirelessly researched, wrote letters, and made calls, but it wasn't until 1987 um, that she connected with other three women, two of whom were patients themselves, and the other one was the sister uh, of one of the patients. 
Um, and in 1990, um, or in 1991, during the first in uh, person meeting that happened around what we call the kitchen table, and there's the picture that you see, they decided to form this organization that they call the United Patients Association for Pulmonary Hypertension, which is currently PHA. Uh, but 19, by 1992, their dedication resulted in sort of the formal incorporation of PHA as a nonprofit entity. And there were a lot of challenges in the first, uh, the first years with a lot of isolation and lack of awareness. Just like Pisana said, a lot of the patients didn't, have, didn't know other patients. Uh, so the first initiatives were very groundbreaking. They started with distributing Pathlight, which is a newsletter, which we still distribute to this day. Um, launching support groups in 1991 and creating a, a, a list of pH treating physicians in 1992. We also had the first peer-to-peer -peer support line that was initiated in the 90, in the early 90s, which remains um, uh, today, which is uh, powered by volunteers. In 94, we had the first PHA conference that laid the foundation for advocacy and education, which is still one of our um, focuses and transitioning from an all volunteer to a staffed organization, which is what we are today. And probably a lot of you know um, or knew Reno Aldrighetti, who was our first paid staff member. So at the beginning, fundraising, um, membership drives, individual donations, creative events like golf tournaments, that's what the association did. And we are today who we are because of Dorothy and those other three women sitting uh, around the kitchen table that had this sort of pioneering and innovative idea to bring all the patients together to end the isolation. So today, PHA stands as a very vibrant community comprising of thousands of patients and caregivers and healthcare providers and also industry partners. We have over 2,200 active members and many, many more subscribers. Um, we really operate now as a hybrid between a advocacy organization and a professional medical society. We have a little bit of both. We're headquartered in Washington, DC. We count on a dedicated team of 36 staff members. We have a budget of close to $9 million and sort of collectively is what we can, we use this force to drive progress and support those affected by, by pH. So I wanted to also give you an idea um, how we fund ourselves uh, because we came a long way between, uh, you know, since that um, meeting around the kitchen table. Right now, most of our funding comes from our corporate partners. And there's several of those, as you know, there's several companies investing in finding therapies for pH. But um, the, the other half of our funding really comes from a variety of sources. Community fundraising is the second biggest one. And we have an accreditation and a registry program, which is sort of part of our medical society aspect. And I'm gonna go into that in a minute. So we haven't lost track of who we are or why we do what we do. So reminding you that um, our mission is to extend and improve the lives of those affected by pH. Effectively, uh, the way we work towards improving patients' quality of life and overall outcomes is by delivering programs um, directly to the patients or indirectly to the patients through those who influence their environment. Uh, and this is in fact how we shape the, the care landscape through all of these activities. So one of those activities is advocacy. Um, advocacy means uh, influencing government, um, insurance payers, which are a big thing in the United States, and pharma companies to do the right thing for patients. The other programs have to do with creating awareness. So we have awareness around um, the public in general, through social media or through the media in general, and we have awareness with uh, patients, caregivers, and the community in general. And in order to educate our patients, we have patient education programs, and we have peer support programs. Those peer support programs were the original programs that um, Dorothy and her peers funded when they created PHA, the support groups. And finally, the medical component. Um, so we network also several uh, healthcare professionals and institutions that provide um, 
medical care in PH. But we don't just stop there. We also develop several medical education programs so those physicians can stay up to date and earn their uh, CMEs, which is critical to maintaining their credentialing. But also we went a step further and about 10 years ago, we started a program of accrediting care centers. And that allowed us to ensure that there's a network of centers in the United States that, um, that can guarantee the minimum standards of care for patients. Um, and finally, we also launched a registry of patients. So I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, but that registry allows us to um, um, develop research and use that registry for research purposes. And also we fund and promote research. That's part of our mission as well uh, to ensure that um, um, the therapies are developed. So advocacy for PH thrives through various avenues. Um, we talk about legislative, regulatory, and judicial pressure. We make really our mark by um, actively participating in meetings with policymakers showing up and collaborating with um, allied organizations. Our focus really is to amplify individual stories that drive change. Advocacy is a very personal thing. And the stories of our patients, the stories that you bring together make a difference in our efforts. Our goal is very clear, is to influence, influence regulations and laws that impact BA patients. We fight for improved access, uh, be it coverage or reimbursement, uh, strengthening the healthcare professional patient relationship and ensuring expert availability. Raising awareness is another way in which we um, help shape the landscape. And raising awareness about pH involves innovative tools like our recent uh, publication, Navigating Pulmonary Hypertension. This resource, which is also available in Spanish, is a unique blend um, combining medical insights with patient support information. It's a product that was crafted um, directly from patient and healthcare provider feedback. And we also have what we call our PH and brochures, which serve as guides, um, shedding some light on the uh, intricate relationship between pulmonary hypertension and the various associated conditions that can lead to PH. Recently, we launched a patient-centered microsite, the PHA Connects Hub. This is a platform that serves as a gateway, uh, seamlessly linking individuals to our most sought after patient resources. So it's basically one-stop shop for all PH patient resources in this hub. And through direct mail, uh, emails, and strategic social media postings, we've uh, ensured that every member of the PH community has access to the, the vital information and the support that we offer at PHA. We take a lot of pride in uh, our patient support groups. Um, forming the largest community of patients and caregivers with over 200 support groups guided by about 260 dedicated volunteer leaders. Some of them are patients themselves or caregivers, and in some cases, medical professionals. So we're fostering connections and, and understanding and ending the isolation. So our goal of ending isolation is perpetual. That's how we got started, and that's something we continue to do. Uh, during the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we transitioned to virtual meetings, um, engaging over 250 attendees per month, ensuring that we had continuous support. So now our support groups are a blend between in-person meetings and virtual meetings. Additionally, um, our PH Friends program extends online and telephone support uh, in both English and Spanish and reaches over 3,000 individuals per year. In terms of patient and family education, we have several avenues by which we uh, provide that education. We have a program called uh, PHA Classroom that is a self-paced, uh, self-administered um, education modules. We also have uh, our month, our weekly newsletters, PHA Connects uh, and PHA News and PHA Live, which are webinars like this one that we have um, every month on different topics on PH. We already have our patient education priorities for 2024. I'm not gonna read them all to you, but you can see they're very varied um, uh, topics. Uh, they're all 
of interest to patients, caregivers, and medical professionals help us develop these um, educational resources. And they're distributed through different channels. Um, we have breakout sessions at conference. We have community workshops that happen in smaller communities. Um, PHA Classroom, which I mentioned earlier, PHA Live, the newsletters, we're launching podcasts next year. And we also have several resources that are in print and can be downloaded from our website. Um, in addition, and probably our most famous uh, patient education resource is our meeting. So please mark your calendars for the 2024 Conference on Scientific Sessions, which is happening in Indianapolis uh, from August 15th to the 18th. Uh, be ready because the call for proposals will kick off in early 2024 and followed by registration and the scholarship application that opens in March. Um, in 24, our focus is on reigniting connections with the whole international community that suffered during COVID. And to ensure inclusivity, we are actually offering Spanish translation options for all sessions, not just the Spanish track. And uh, our, our scientific sessions uh, are going to be featuring a recap from the World Symposium, which is happening in Barcelona six weeks earlier. I mentioned um, that in addition to patient education, we also educate the healthcare professionals. So similarly to the patient education programs, we have several um, CME uh, programs for medical professionals. We have PHA Online University, which is an, an online self-based learning. We have On Demand, which healthcare professionals can request those programs and we come to their medical institution. They're like grand rounds. We have the PHPN Symposium. We recently had uh, the last symposium in Washington in September with a record attendance of 600 medical professionals. Um, we have the scientific sessions at the PHA conference. And we also have a journal that is published four times a year um, online, Advances in Pulmonary Hypertension. The other big program that we have to advance care and research for PH and to shape the landscape uh, of today's PH care is our PHCC program, which is the accredited PH care centers network. There's over 83 programs that are accredited throughout the United States. Some are comprehensive care programs, the CCC, some are regional care programs, and there's also some pediatric programs. And there's actually a record number of applications that we're trying to process. But the point of this program is to ensure that there are certain guidelines and certain criteria that are met so that we can guarantee patients who are being seen at those programs um, uh, are gonna be seen with that criteria and they're gonna uh, receive a level of care that um, is acceptable. And there's already some signs of success about the program. So I wanted to show you some of the trends. We measure the success of the program um, by looking at patient outcomes. Um, so we have three different variables that we measure. The first one is the percentage of patients that remain in the program in functional class three and four. And you can see throughout the year, starting 2016, when we started measuring uh, through 2022, that percentage uh, has decreased. Of course, we want most patients to transition to class one. Uh, similarly, hospitalizations per 100 patient years has decreased significantly since 2017 until 2022. This regard 2016, that's sort of the, the benchmark here and it's uh, probably not accurate. So this regard 2016. Uh, and similarly, the death per 1,000 patient year seen at the program since we implemented the standards uh, and the criteria has decreased as well. And finally, I wanted to talk about the registry uh, because it's another um, component of the accreditation program. FAR is the PHA patient registry that has over 2,700 enrolled patients across 70 of those 83 centers that I mentioned earlier. Not all centers are participating in the registry, but the majority of those do. Uh, this is a US-based initiative. It's a prospective longitudinal and observational registry, which includes individuals with PAH, CTEF, and also pediatric uh, pH due to the uh, developmental lung disease. And the registry is not just a, data, a database, it's a vital tool to measure and enhance the quality of care. So we use that to measure those um, um, variables that I showed you earlier. Uh, it delves into risk factors affecting patient outcomes and also assesses 
uh, the clinical effectiveness of the therapies. It plays an important role in facilitating clinical trials um, so we can partner with industry to find patients that would be eligible for clinical trials. And we foster, it is used to foster collaboration among the PH centers that are participating. And finally, um, it allows the centers that participate to, um, it supports their reaccreditation program. So we use the information there to every three years reaccredit those centers. So that's really a very, very brief or a very quick recap in how uh, and in the US and at PHA, um, we advance the, the care of patients and we shape the landscape through our organization that has over 30 years of experience doing what we do. So thank you again, Pisana, for inviting me and I'd like to turn it over to the next speaker. Thanks very much, Matt. Next up, we have Melanie from HTAP France. Melanie? Can you hear me now? Yes, it's a little quiet, but <laughs> we hear you. Uh, uh, well, I want to thank you, Matt, and I want to thank PHA because uh, as we are here, uh, we've been really, really inspired by uh, PHA and still are. What uh, you've just shown, Matt, is uh, a very ambitious program and a model for all of us we saw much smaller associations. I'm going to tell you about the adventure we had in France in uh, creating uh, the, the, the pulmonary hypertension and patient association. Um, I would like to come back to the context of uh, the end of the 20th century. Susanna has already talked about this and done that as well for a little, but uh, I also it experimented a part of it, so I wanted to tell you my vision of it. Well, I was not there in uh, 19, uh, 1890, sorry, uh, 1891 when uh, PH was first described, but I was there um, about 100 years later when, uh, when we were talking about primary pulmonary abstention and it was already said in uh, 1973 in uh, Geneva that primary, primary hypertension is a rare disease. And at uh, that period, the total number of case reports to date was of hundreds. And now it's, of course, of um, hundreds of thousands. Um, you can see here on the right the, the first report of the first WPHS. Uh, which is something quite history. Uh, what happened in the in the in the seventies and the eighties is in fact, in fact, uh, PH was not known as a disease. It was much more seen like just a symptom with bad prognosis. Uh, echocardiography didn't really exist. Well, not in routine anyway. Before the eighties. There were only electrocardiograms, X-ray, and catheterism, uh, and the treatments uh, were only calcium blockers and nothing else. As knowledge on PAH improved, um, patients became as well um, more informed. Um, Dana mentioned the first heart transplant in the United States, of course, in 1981, a bit later in France. You see that done, commemorating the first uh, heart lung transplantation in France. The first medicine was a proper phenol, so Roland, which was approved in the US in 95 and in France uh, three years later. Um, uh, the, then in, in Avion, uh, they decided to stop talking about primary or secondary uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension, and this was uh, a step forward. And what happened then is that uh, for for the for 
touched by people in uh, 1996. The French representatives were invited by PHA to their, uh, uh, their conference. And uh, Professor Duroux sent uh, a doctor called uh, Francois, uh, Francois Breno and a patient called Peter Cabo uh, to the conference. And they were uh, really amazed and they find it absolutely great. And uh, found the idea of creating an association a good idea. So they de decided in uh, 1996 straight away after the PHA conference to create Association des patients who found hypertension arterial pulmonaire, which is quite a long name. And when uh, François Breno died, it's, uh, his name was added to the name of the association. At that time, the budget was really, really small. It was no more than uh, 1,000 euros. It was, uh, the association was depending on personal needs, on hospital. Um, meetings were happening at the hospital. You know, that there was a, uh, a center that was uh, concentrating on JS. It was uh, in the hospital on Grand Bechner when uh, the, the, the whole French team was working. Um, and uh, the association created uh, its magazine called Cap Vert, which still exists, but uh, has uh, different looks now. The first issue was in 1997. Um, I've put here um, you know, the timeline with the discovery of uh, different things that are implied in a in pulmonary arterial hypertension. Why that? Because, in fact, um, the first medical announcement we had in uh, 1998 was the disco discovery of the gene uh, BMPR2, uh, BMPR2 which, uh, which was the first identified as implied in uh, GA. So, um, Uh, we we used to have wonder like invited by the by the French group to listen to this uh, new um, medical discovery. Um, then the French Patient Association started to separate a bit better. Uh, what happened also is that uh, um, well the, the the founder died. Dr. Beno also died, and uh, we had to organize ourselves to, to make the, the association go on. And uh, we also had the idea to create a, a website, uh, but then we needed some funds, some more funds. Uh, and we, we had the idea to, uh, uh, to ask uh, uh, support from uh, Black to Welcome, who produced Flowland, and uh, they accepted, and they put our first official sponsor. Um, so the association evol evaluated, uh, it got a new name, ACAP France, which you know today, a new logo, new statutes, and uh, uh, a new address outside of the hospital. That's important because it was uh, um, the beginning of uh, independence. And also, uh, we started to hire a few, a few hours of uh, salaried work because it was quite difficult for working people or for patients to be able to run the association from a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, on top of our national day uh, at, the, at our jam, a general assembly, uh, we also decided to have our first regional meeting because, you know, people in France were a bit jealous of, uh, the, of the ones in Paris who had everything and who were close to the information. So that first regional meeting was in the north of France, which, as you may know, is not very far from Belgium. And there were already the Belgian people who were there. So it was uh, our first meeting, first regional, but also international meeting. Um, in that two, uh, well, then came in our second uh, of course, pharmaceuticals like for many uh, thousand weeks in uh, Bruxelles on the 78th of November, so we decided to create PSA Europe, an umbrella association, who, which you all know. Um, by Well, we were just a little group of PH uh, patient association, and uh, uh, so that came, uh, the association came to birth there, and uh, 
interesting. Uh, we then created a new support, uh, new support uh, of information like a newsletter, and then we uh, we had the chance in France to to have uh, the creation of the rare diseases network, which um, which allowed uh, the pulmonary hypertension network to to have a reference center and twenty competent regional centers. There are now there are still the same uh, centers, but uh, just uh, a few more. We decided in 2005 to have uh, a formal scientific committee because uh, before that we really had the, the help of the of the physicians. But uh, then we wanted to make it official and as well with um, uh, people from other regions, not only Paris. You can see here Professor Simono and Professor Dartevel, uh, whom you may know. And uh, I took a note at the end of the page to say that between 96 and, uh, well, uh, 1996 and uh, 220, the French Association participated to create a conference uh, because, as I said before, it was an inspiration. And you can see here the little photo showing uh, our representative, myself, and uh, uh, and um, uh, Rino Alzeguet. Afterwards, there were new steps for ASAP et France. Uh, in uh, 2006, uh, they, we, we had our 10th anniversary. With, uh, we were lucky enough to have a uh, former Miss France to, to celebrate this. And uh, from uh, the year after, I became a salary director. I was, uh, before that, I, I used to be uh, the second president. And uh, we reorganized the game and uh, made uh, ourselves a little bit more professional and got uh, some more sponsors and uh, got a uh, higher budget. Um, and uh, we decided also to support more and communicate more with the research team, which you can see on the right. You can see uh, our former president, Sylvain Redley, with uh, Professor Humbert and Professor Montagny and also the German uh, doctor. Uh, and um, uh, so this is still a, a very strong link we, we we still have with uh, with the researchers, and I'm sure some of them are listening to us today. In 2010, we had our first national conference for the patients and um, and carers, which happens every every three years. Um, and we started to use social media to, and we had more and more events called the uh, Aplan Pumon to uh, raise awareness and also to uh, to fundraise. I had to go quite quickly because I think you're a bit late. Uh, so I want to talk now about the challenges as uh, the Aplan faces, like. Uh, uh, every other association. We need more transparency. We need diversification of funding. We all have, I think, difficulties in uh, recruiting volunteers, and uh, we all need to be more professional. Uh, I put here the photos of uh, the next two presidents, Kenny Dufresne and uh, Laure uh, Rosé, whom, uh, you, whom you probably uh, know. And um, uh, I think that now we uh, focus more, we need to focus more, focus more um, on uh, quality of life now that we have, a, we are lucky enough to have the treatment we need and uh, that uh, research is in a, in, a, in a very good way, very dynamic. And uh, we still have to enhance collaboration between the different um, stakeholders. And uh, in fact, we, we never, we, we should never lose the the focus uh, on the fact that uh, what we do has to make sense for patients and carers. And um, still, after all, what we do is a teamwork. We can't do it uh, just by ourselves. We all have to work all together. I just want to show very quickly the areas of action of uh, PHA Europe, uh, the story of uh, France. And uh, just here you see uh, the little logos that uh, 
are all the those of um, some of our actions like uh, regional meetings, um, our conference, uh, general assembly, weekend of our family, which, which is a family weekend. Uh, I haven't talked about this, but so also we care for the pediatric patients and it's also very important and the capacity for uh, people to be able to socialize easier. Um, and uh, I just want now to show you how SDAPESONS now is working in its environment with all the stakeholders of uh, its environment. Uh, Locals, they want to say we are in an ideal constellation, which means, in fact, we, ha we are lucky enough to have the, uh, the physicians, the research, um, the pharmaceutical industries, other associations, public authorities, um, medical health care, uh, carers, and uh, expert centers uh, that all work together. And uh, it's the only way I think we can we can go further, and uh, we still have to have to stick to to this. Uh, so a little photo of uh, because now uh, our mentor is uh, Professor Amber as he's for a four and is still um, supporting us. Although the still all support us, like uh, um, physicians we've known uh, earlier. And this is our uh, mo most recent president, so Maggie Surat, and I know that she's listening to us, so I cheer her up. Um, well, thank you for listening to, to me, and uh, I'm awaiting for your question before uh, letting the German Association, represented by Gita, to present this stuff. Great. Thanks very <laughs> much. Melanie, really appreciate that and agree with your call for coming together. Uh, Dieter, I'm going to um, start to pull up your slides and uh, please go ahead when you're ready. Okay, okay. Well, thank you uh, all that I can join this uh, meeting, that I can show you something about the short history of the German organization. Well, it was founded in 96 uh, due to the reason that our founder, Bruno Kopp, was himself a patient and he was looking for um, options how he can treat his uh, disease. It was a hard time. And at that time, the major points where we where you can meet some help for um, PH was Gießen, Heidelberg and uh, Bad Nauheim. And the pioneers in this era, in this time, were Werner Seger, Adushi Gofrani, uh, Horst Olszewski, and Eckert Grünig. And they started with the treatment, and they are still now are still active. Well, what was the conception and the target of the community? A very in the very beginning, oh, sorry, I, I, yeah, okay, you saw it. In the in the very beginning, we had a, a view or focus um, on on the patients uh, and to look to improve their situation. Our target was also to meet the patients very close to their living area and to transfer knowledge about pH uh, throughout uh, throughout uh, Germany. It was the hardest point because not many people know what pH is and how it comes from. <clears throat> the next point was to include politicians and decision makers in this uh, process to improve the general situation. And uh, the hardest point was the installation of an operation platform, um, which um, which helps that uh, the the system is running. <clears throat> and uh, the last point is how to get uh, physicians, industry, and patient groups on one table. For this reason, we installed in once a year um, a patient meeting in Frankfurt where experts are giving reports about newest drugs, about newest um, 
techniques uh, and developments and where patients could exchange about their disease, which was very helpful then with them. The next point is um, the major steps in the uh, development. Uh, in the early stage, we implemented an academic consultant group consisting of 14 uh, physicians to help in general questions. The next step was um, additional education for nurses. We started in the in, in 2006. Uh, we started with a special education for nurses and they help to be more familiar with the disease because they are close to the patient. And uh, an important step was the installation of uh, um, and support for research. So once a year, we spend it an award for uh, research to help to improve the situation. And the next important part was uh, the annual award for best publication, which was done um, <clears throat> in Frankfurt. Next page. The clinical development. I'm now for 10 years uh, as a president of the German organizations, and during this time, uh, many things have improved. The available drugs for treatment are improved very in a big step, and helped uh, the people to get, you know, and help the people to um, improve their quality of life. Clinical trials have been installed with good results. And since last year, we had the, the last and uh, the new guidelines, uh, which helps uh, all over the world to uh, treat for this in the same methods. And last but not least, due to the AFPH, we have uh, a knowledge sharing platform, which uh, shows overall how to improve uh, how to to get more knowledge about the disease. And uh, finally, research and uh, genetic development have shown us how to how to treat the patients. Well, we are about uh, one thousand three hundred members in Germany, and ninety eight percent of these people are um, working pro bono. And only our office is uh, with paid uh, people um, to keep uh, a five days opening um, program. Well, that's um, the most important part is the next page is National and international organizations got a big step forward in the past. We got new drugs. We got more knowledge about the disease, even if we cannot heal it. The quality of patients and the, the lifespan of the patient have been enlarged. But it's very important. That's a, our meaning. It's very important to share in a global community and to help the patients. I hope I can give you a short review about this and uh, thank you for questions. Thank you very much, Dieter. Good to see how the German patient group has uh, evolved. Uh, Pisana, I think you're going to do a summary next. Uh, I'm actually going to be very brief because we're running out of time, but I just um, wanted to show you how we've gone from zero patient associations before the 1990s to over 90 today, spread across six continents. So without going into details about all of them, because it's uh, it's not our role here today, 
It is just to show that we've come a very long way. There are still parts of the world that are not very, very well served. There's uh, still scope for improvement. Uh, but on the whole, this is a, a major achievement. Uh, I would like to thank the PHA for allowing us to use their map, which was there on their website. And I just have one more slide to say that this is a very extensive, but also a very diverse uh, care landscape and support landscape because uh, there are different types of patient organizations. Uh, many can offer support like resources, community connections at local, regional, and global levels. Many associations have set up forums, message boards, and social media accounts where individuals can share their experiences, insights, and advice. There's also a whole new a world of spontaneous informal social media groups and influencer blogs. This is quite recent. Um, some industries, some company companies have also set up support platforms and these are gaining prominence. Of course, the level of support varies very much depending on different factors, including economic, political, geographic context, the size of the association, funding possibilities, competencies, digital skills, and the support of healthcare professionals. There are still many regions, as I've mentioned, that still have no patient associations or not enough. This is a challenge that can be partly mitigated by connecting online, but this is only where internet access is available. But most of all, over time, and this is what Gergely will be talking about, the role of patient associations has evolved from providing support to patients and families to including awareness and advocacy activities and to being involved in healthcare decisions. We've heard from the PHA, from HDRP France and from PHEV, how, much, how involved they are in these types of activities. And now Gergely is going to be giving us a, a sort of an overview. Thank you for your kind attention. All right. So many thanks uh, again for having me and welcome everyone who joined this uh, evening to learn a little bit about uh, history. But I promise I am not going to talk about the history because I think that there will uh, there was a very comprehensive review as as we could learn. But I would like to focus some of the points which I think important um, to underline. So this is uh, this slide is about how actually the patient and the physician relationship evolved. So there was an active passive. After that, we have the guidance, and now we are at the later phase, which is about shared decision making, which is also reflected in the new guidelines. However, if we have a closer look on how the patient association and the physician relationship and also the patient association and the global community as well as the wider community relates to each other, there are also steps we could um, um, explore. I'm not focusing on the PH association at this point, but rather thinking about the more general and a different perspective. Actually, the very first self-help group already established in the 40s. So if you can recall the presentation from Matt, PH a little bit uh, behind this. However, there was also a kind of um, waves uh, regarding um, in the 60s, where stigmatization was uh, one of the first advocacy goal of these patient associations. And modern advocacy we can talk about in the 18 and 90s. And why we are talking about patient association during this meeting? Because uh, there's a good news within the PH guidelines that for the very first time we have a separate section about patient association and patient involvement. Moreover, in the recommendation, there's a clear recommendation that PH centers should collaborate with PH or patient association. I just jump over the definition of patient association, but it's rather talking about nonprofit association, which are led by patients 
or mainly patients, but I think that there's a room for improvement and discussion about this because there are high standards of um, patient association should meet, but probably we will cover it later in the discussion section. Started as PH associations in a round table discussion. However, at the end, now we are PH associations can play. As you can see, there's a nice um, essence of PH association role where they can nicely contribute uh, and ultimately uh, enhance the quality of life of patients. So advocacy is one of the key um, focus of PH association, as we could learn most recently. However, there is a very uh, complicated landscape where PH association should work. So at the first, let me focus on connections to European scientific societies. First of all, we have the ERN lung. This is a quite new formation. The abbreviation stands for the European Reference Network for Rare Respiratory Diseases. However, this ERN lung is um, consisting of um, healthcare professionals. There's a nice way for patients to interact. There's a very professional body, so-called patient board, which is part of the main decision-making body, the Medical Steering Committee. And I'm happy to let you know that um, the main uh, umbrella associations like uh, PHA Europe, as well as the Alliance for PH is represented at the highest level. So the mission of this ERL lung is to enhance the cross-border healthcare um, like uh, contributing to innovative care models and try to build up a sustainable and more effective cross-border their healthcare. There are online tools, I cannot go into details, but the main tool, how ERN lung is operating, is built on the very important message that it is the knowledge to travel, but not the patient. So there are a couple of panels, second opinions, which contribute to better healthcare. Turning to another uh, important um, vehicle or a platform. It is the European Lung Health Group. Um, there were lots of collaboration with PHA Europe, like uh, the Renew of Call to Action. And uh, the main idea behind this was that actually lots of common teams are, which are shared uh, by um, um, respiratory association, not only rare, but more common ones. And this uh, formation was launched in 2012. Uh, 20, and you can see um, the funding members there. Main area of this working is connections to WHO, to the European uh, Parliament, to the European Commission. And there's a special formation consisting of the members of the European Parliament. It is called the MEP. Unfortunately, this work should be a little bit restarted after the new election of the European Parliament. There were a couple of projects or initiatives which were organized under the umbrella of this European Lung Health Group. One of them is the PREF for 2013 vision, which is a foresight uh, understanding of the future healthcare. You can see the very important or interesting points what we were actually advocating for. There's the Raising Awareness Project under this group. This is so-called key prething and it for was launched most recently in the European Respiratory Society meeting in Milan. And last but not least, we also need to um, mention one of our um, common projects with this group, which was organized in the middle of the COVID. It was about a research topic, um, which uh, was uh, fostered and held by this group attended by members of the European Parliament. Um, the next one, uh, which is, I think, the utmost importance is the European Respiratory Society, our uh, most influenced um, ally. There's um, lots of way of collaboration. Patient involvement 
is ensured in many task forces. We call them clinical research collaboration, one of them, and also other task forces where we represented the patient perspective. I need to underline again and again that it was uh, um, initiated by the ERS and our um, PH physician partners that it was the very first time that uh, patients and patient advocates were involved in the guidelines together with PISA and AVI could uh, contribute to this paper. It was also under the umbrella of ERS. And uh, there was another interesting paper, which is not a guideline, but a statement on CTEP, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. On top of that, there were many other papers I cannot cover this time, but I would like to also mention the so-called ERS vision, where we were invited together with Pisana to talk about how it is uh, how the life of patients were under the COVID restrictions. Naturally, if we are talking about ERS, we need to talk about ESC, the other big um, society, scientific society. Um, it is covering cardiologists, the ERS is covering uh, pulmonologists. As you might know, it is uh, differs from country to country, which um, um, physicians are the mainly the treating physicians of patient living with pulmonary hypertension. So this is the reason that they are sharing a common guideline on pulmonary hypertension. Um, with this, I would like to turn to one specific paper we just covered in the most recent webinar. This was also a collaboration, a close collaboration with the European Society of Cardiology. It is about quality indicators, and we just covered a nice webinar on this. I think it's a kind of um, topic you will hear more and more in the coming months and years. Naturally, there are other scientific societies I would like to briefly cover, but this um, working relationship is not as close as with ESC and ERS. Within ESC, we have a so-called patient forum where patients can express um, their wish and also contribute with the help of uh, professionals into many scientific papers. In the ERS, in the European Society of um, Respiratory Society, it is called the European Lung Foundation. They have many, many projects. I really urge you to connect uh, these initiatives. They are very valuable. Some of them is called the, the European Patient Advisory Program, which is a nice uh, learning tool. But on top of that, the Patient Advisory Group, which is the formation of patient advocates living with pulmonary hypertension is one of the most influential part of ELF and can really uh, contribute and connect to the scientific society. I think this is one of the last slides regarding the scientific societies. It is about ESO, the European Society for Organ Transplantation. This scientific society is also opening towards the patient. It was the very first time where patients can um, open their annual congress. It was Pisana in Athens, has um, the possibility to create uh, many, many participants. I say many, many participants because it is not solely focusing on pH or on lung diseases, but other solid organ donation and uh, solid uh, organ transplantation. They are opening towards the patient community. There was a um, launch of um, ITPO. It is called the European Transplant Patient Organization. Then the collaboration is um, evolving very nicely. It was not the last slide, it seems, but I need to also talk about the World Symposium. I saw Melanie's um, slides. She also referred or used the logo. I would not like to go into details. It was already covered, but I would like to rather give you um, the possibility which uh, this association or symposium are ensuring. As you know, there's a regular review of the guidelines. However, the World Symposium is now working on how the new pH guidelines will be look like and what kind of novelties they can bring in. 
Um, patients were involved from the very beginning. However, the structured involvement is starting, we can say, from Nice, where um, a nice paper was also published with the involvement uh, of Pisana. Uh, there's um, confidentiality regarding the new uh, proceedings and also the talk about what will happen during um, the next, the seventh World Symposium next year in Barcelona. But uh, I think I can tell you that there's a special task force dedicated to patients. It's also publicly available on the World Symposium uh, um, web page. And I'm really looking forward to um, those work and uh, the proceedings as well as the result of such discussion. Briefly, we need to cover the European Regulatory Authority. So you can see that we are starting from discussion within or around a nice table with PH association. And now we can see that involvement of patients already possible in the regulatory work. So European Medicines Agency is the um, main body of uh, the authority within Europe. You might know that there's a centralized marketing authorization procedures, which means that it is the European Medicines Agency which approve the drugs. However, it does not mean that you, in your respective country, you will receive that specific medication because the reimbursement is still at the membership level. Um, there's a very complex um, involvement of patients in the work of EMA. I cannot go into details, but you can see that there's various ways like patients could be represented by their association and also within the main body, the management board, but also patients can be involved on an individual level as experts. Many, many scientific committees are um, linked to the work of the EMA and the EMA secretary. You can see the very um, yellow um, signs. It is all the committees which are linking to the very process regarding market authorization where patients are involved. And I need to let you know that now there's an open call to become part of one of the um, such committees. So I urge you, if you have the energy and time to devote to apply for this position, it's quite time consuming and it's a long kind of commitment of three years, but I think that that's um, a life-changing experience to become part of such kind of um, really um, key opinion leaders with expert patients who are part of this work. And um, we cannot uh, uh, end uh, any kind of uh, discussion without having connections to other patients. So previously we talked about physicians, now we talk about uh, authorities, but on um, a more general level, there are lots of uh, discussions happening which have direct effect on the life of uh, uh, patients living with pulmonary hypertension. I, I think I need to underline the role of urologists. They are a very influential one. And sometimes I need to admit that they are making our life a little bit tough because once it comes to rare diseases on European level, many uh, things about solely urologists who are representing all patients living with rare diseases. So sometimes it's quite difficult to say that Come on, there are many disease-specific organizations, but I do not say that they are not making a very high-level um, work, but sometimes we need to be really vigilant to be in a position to contribute to some of the interesting papers. You can see the pillars, they are working on rare disease policies, European-level action plans, also with the involvement of European Parliament, members of the European Parliament. And um, this is also another very influential um, body, the European Patients Forum. They are not only focusing on rare diseases, but more general one, shaping the new European agenda on healthcare policies. I think that there are a couple of challenges and opportunities we can talk about, but I'm not going to into details. Probably I will leave on um, 
this on the screen and open for uh, questions and um, comments to this. Probably there might be some um, questions regarding uh, the challenges. And also I have a, another side about uh, opportunities. Many thanks uh, for your um, kind attention. Thank you, Gargoli. We did have one question. Uh, what does it take for a patient association to transition from a more advocacy-oriented platform to rather um, being involved uh, as a medical entity? So how can uh, patient groups transition from advocacy to medical uh, involvement? I imagine yeah, take, I putting think, together a uh, medical advisory board as some part of it or could, right? Yeah, I think uh, probably I can answer, but uh, Matt is very well positioned because as we learned from PHA US, they are rather transitioning into um, a medical kind of it, uh, approval of sensors. But I think uh, if I can briefly... Um, pick this question and hand over to, to Matt. I think that it's um it's rather having a vision or mission within the heads of the leaders of the page association because there's a lot of way how patient association can contribute and involve in policy work and so on. For instance, uh, nowadays there's a revision of the rare disease plans in each and all countries, which is an excellent opportunity to be to become visible on a local level. Also, there are other possibilities like ELF, European uh, Lung Foundation, Patient Adv Advisory Group, also ER and lung and so on, where you can connect with others and shape um, the future of, of our life. So I can add to that. And I think the first step is ensuring that you have access to the medical experts in the field and <clears throat> offering them an opportunity to volunteer for your organization, which is what we did. And we formed a scientific leadership council. And so those experts in the field, most of them physicians, but also other healthcare professionals, nurses, uh, registered nurse, uh, physician assistants, um, nurse practitioners, they started providing their own resources or developing their own resources for their own education. There's no association or medical society in the U.S. that focuses specifically on pH. So the education was for cardiovascular diseases in general, and there was nothing for pH. So we were able to fill that niche. Uh, so I would say that if it's not one or the other, I think that's why we call ourselves a hybrid. We do both. We're a patient advocacy organization, and we also serve uh, in part as the medical society for pH um, practitioners only, because we have the experts, we we network the experts, the, they are um, willing to volunteer for us and do the work that is necessary. So what you're gonna need is just put together that network of um, experts and um, once they put that time, then you can move forward with that part of your um, offering. Thanks, Matt. Are there any other questions from uh, the panelists to one another? Okay, well, with that, I wanna thank everybody for their presentations and for sharing uh, their thoughts. And uh, we look forward to publishing all of these uh, changes or all of these videos and slides on the knowledge sharing platform very shortly. So make sure to check there and also follow the PH Alliance on LinkedIn and Facebook so you can see what we'll be up to next year. Look forward to connecting then and take care.